Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Jamison and Blake here, and we're in for the Schooner Pod, talking about some pre-weekend spread going by each conference and seeing what we have to offer for the season. Blake, are we ready to break down the Big Ten today? Oh, I'm ready. Usually we've only done a little gambling preview before the season, but this year we're going all out. We're doing all Power 5 conference, a G5 episode, and a gambling preview. I'm so excited to just dive into these conferences. I think we're starting out with a good one with the Big Ten. Uh, Intriguing at the top, but also kind of interesting in the midfield as well. So I'm ready to dive into some action. Yeah, I completely agree. And I know for a lot of listeners, like, oh, this is not OU content. If you want OU content, we're still releasing stuff every single week. Um, The episode this week, we went into how hot OU's recruiting is getting. And obviously, as of today, on Thursday, July 14th, we just got a new commit in Dalen Smothers. So if you want to kind of get a recap of all things July and June recruiting, go check that episode out as well. And then we'll be having OU content every single week till the season. Um, But every week, we'll break down a conference. We're starting with Big Ten. So we kind of have a set of questions we wanted to, you know, dabble on um, going into this. And really, let's talk about the contenders. Um, You kind of already talked about that it's very top heavy in the Big Ten, Ohio State, Michigan. Um, But does Ohio State have much to worry about with their dominance losing, you know, their big two wide receivers this year? No, they don't have anything to worry about because they have two wide receivers coming up right under them that could be just as good. Uh, Like, Ohio State's offense has three legitimate Heisman finalist contenders. C.J. Stroud, Travion Henderson, and Jackson Smith and Nick Jigba are incredible players. Last year, they're averaging about 45 points uh, per game on the offensive side, and honestly, with C.J. Stroud having another year under his belt, we could see this jump to 50. That this, I am so excited to watch this offense. I think they're really one of those actual national championship contenders, maybe even the best or the second best team in the nation. So, even though they lose lose some offensive firepower they had guys waiting in the wings that could honestly be better yeah jackson jackson smith and jigba which is really hard to say if i was an ohio state podcast i'd have it down by now but you know he just set um a bowl record getting like 347 yards and three scores and 15 catches in his last game and you look at it and he was next to garrett wilson and chris Olave. and is this a legitimate thing of an Njigba is he going to carry that on as a number one wide receiver because it's really easy to look good as a number three wide receiver whenever you have two top 15 um, picks right in front of you Um, he's still pretty young too so he's coming into his junior season right so is he going to be like a stud wide receiver one or was he kind of a product of the two people ahead of him and also I mean what do you think about all these videos we've seen about like Marvin Harrison jr as well is he more of a hype play or because of his name and kind of watching the workout videos or does he actually have a chance to make a mark in this offense no i think jackson jackson smith and jigba is the real deal uh people that i trust and people that i listen to in the offseason who really go and evaluate these guys say he could be better than garrett wilson and chris Olave. that really that when they watched the tape from last year he was the one shining on the field even though he probably was yes probably getting worse corner safeties on him People are really hype about him, and even more than what we saw last year. And Marvin Harrison's the real deal, too, but I just think Jackson Smith and Jigba is so much better. Uh, it's And also, he gets the advantage of having C.J. Stroud with another year under his belt that we saw in the beginning last year for Ohio State. Their defense struggled. C.J. Stroud struggled a little bit, and, and uh, Ohio, some Ohio State fans were calling for his head early on, but by the end of the season, nobody was saying that. So I think he's going to have the advantage of C.J. Stroud kind of taking that next leap and having uh, that time under his belt. So I just I think this Ohio State team is going to be a significantly better version than what we saw last year. 
Yeah, whenever you're catching that many balls in one game, obviously you have some talent to you. I'm really looking forward to see how that offense works and see if C.J. Stroud can put himself in respect as a first-round draft pick coming into this draft because a lot of people thought he was more of a fluke because of all the talent he had around him. Let's see if he's for real this year. I'm really excited to see that. The defense will be really interesting too. Um, they had a lot of youth in their uh, secondary, which most of them are returning. And plus they have a new defensive coordinator and Jim Knowles coming from Oklahoma State. Uh, are they going to be kind of a handicap? I mean, are a worry on defense this year? Or are you thinking this team could be a complete solid all-around team? I think the defense is definitely not going to match anywhere near like the offense's pedigree, but I think the addition of Jim Knowles really helps them. That uh, we saw at Oklahoma State, like Oklahoma State before Jim Knowles got there, like they had some good defensive uh, seasons, but they were more known for like the typical like Big Twelve off offensive firepower. And we saw over the last few seasons. Oklahoma State became more successful because they were a more defensive team. They're more physical up front. So I think Jim Knowles was like a great hire for uh, Ohio State that has the talent but just kind of needs the better coaching, better physicality up front. And even though they're returning a lot of guys from a defense that wasn't that good, I just think Jim Knowles at least gets them to the point where they're serviceable. That in games last year when Tulsa was putting up 30 points on them and some of these in Minnesota early on where they were having these scares, like Ohio State was still putting up 40, 50 points in those games. But if they could just get something serviceable on that side of the ball, like I don't think anybody in this league can touch them. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and then I guess kind of the other big contender, um, looking at odds, you know, Ohio State, according to DraftKings Sportsbook, to win this conference is at minus 210. And then the next goes all the way down to plus 600 at Michigan. So these are the two top dogs in this conference, as we're usually used to. Um, tell me more about Michigan, Blake, because are, who are we going to see at quarterback? I know there's like J.J. McCarthy and Cade McNamara there. Um, they lost a lot of people, you know, in this draft. How solid of a team is this, and are they anything to put into stock in terms of betting? Yeah, I'm I'm not as high on Michigan this year. I think uh, they're probably, we're going to see uh, Cade McNamara again as the starter and just J.J. Uh, McCarthy waiting in the wings. Um, they bring back, honestly, a lot on offense. Like, the good thing that they'll have is uh, two young quarter or I guess not young quarterbacks, but two solid quarterbacks, Blake Corum as their running back, and then they're bringing back one of the best offensive line units uh, in the nation. Last year, they won the award for the top unit this year they're bringing back majority of their starters on that end so you really like what you see on the offensive side of the ball but even then I didn't think they were super dynamic last year offensively like I thought they uh their defense was really what won them games and uh what we see there is they're probably going to be solid but you lose Aiden Hutchinson you lose four of your five guys that were leading the team in tackles and I, they're only refor returning four starters on that like side of the ball and a new defensive coordinator since they lost their last one, I believe, to the Ravens this offseason. So I think the offense will still be solid, but what won them the game last year versus Ohio State was defense, 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 and I just don't think they have the same weapons or the Aiden Hutchinson that really gives them the X factor on that defensive line to put pressure on C.J. Stroud. Yeah, I think that Ohio State-Michigan game was like really cold, and it was obviously a very hostile environment, and that kind of plays to a really good defense. Whenever you lose, you know, Aiden Hutchinson, David Ajabo, and then Dax Hill in the next level, like that's, you know, if Ajabo didn't get hurt, that's three first-round talents in the, from the decent defensive side of the ball that y'all are losing. So, I mean, I'm a little bit worried about Michigan. There's no one that really gets me up and excited. I mean, Donovan Edwards, you know, and Blake Corum, at the running back position kind of gets me excited. That's a pretty solid um, unit. I saw a lot of good things from Donovan Edwards and his youth in beginning uh, the season last year. So I, I will keep an eye on them, but I'm pretty skeptical of them as being, you know, this team like they were last year. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, those are the two top um, people really in the big 10. You can talk about Wisconsin and all of that, but we'll get to them a little bit later. I'm sure we'll talk about them, but if we're making a conference future bet, Blake, and we're seeing odds, I can just kind of read them all off to the users um, right now. Minus 210 for Ohio State, Michigan at plus 600, Wisconsin at plus 1100, Penn State at plus 1600, Iowa plus 2000, and Nebraska at plus 2200. I'll stop right there. Um, 
or I guess I might as well say Michigan State at plus 2,800. Why not? Um, what kind of piques your interest of something you might um, play some money on? Yeah, so when I'm looking at this, there were three teams that kind of popped off the table. Uh, I'll go through the two that I kind of had to rule out at the end of the day. First, I think people go to is Penn State. Penn State's kind of the obvious, like, third third team in that division that really kind of gives Michigan and Ohio State fits year to year. Like last year, Penn State was even leading uh, for most of the game till Ohio State came back. So, uh, and at plus 1,800, you think that's going to be good, but... Man, Sean Clifford is still the quarterback there, and they are not pivoting off of him. And I know we saw that Iowa game where he went down and they played pitiful, but this guy is just not good. Like, he's just not going to lead a dynamic. You need either a solid, incredible defense to beat Ohio State, or you need to match him in firepower, and he does not do that on the firepower end. And they have to travel to Michigan. They get Ohio State at home. I just think Michigan's the better team there, and... You, you basically, you have to go perfect till you play Ohio State. Like, you have to go perfect in this division, and there's just too many flaws uh, with Penn State, so I knocked them out. Next was Wisconsin, because you have to think about the other side of the bracket. It's like, you basically have to beat Ohio State once, and the championship game provides a good opportunity to do that. But Wisconsin, again, is just like... They have Braylon Allen, a uh, really good running back. They have Graham Mertz, so I think he's a right quarterback, but they just lose a lot on the defensive side of the ball, and they lost a lot of their top 10 tacklers. I think they lost eight of them. Like, uh, it's just not a good... I just don't really know what to think about Wisconsin. So I got weird with it. I went the Minnesota Gold, <laughs> Golden Gophers. Oh my goodness, 2,800. And, yeah, insanely big, and... But the only reason why is, like, I want to pick somebody from that side of the division that maybe they have a fluke game against Ohio State and beat them in the championship and they can pay out this future. And last year, we saw Minnesota take Ohio State into the fourth quarter. They were neck and neck till Ohio State pulled away. And it was all because of uh, Muhammad Ibrahim, who went down in that game. He was a great running back. And... West Con- or sorry, not Wisconsin. Minnesota was the final week of last year. They almost won the division. It was because I I can't remember how it all the tiebreakers shaked up, but I think it was because of a tiebreaker they didn't make the championship game, mm-hmm. and that was on their like fourth and fifth string running backs that they were playing. So a run heavy team like Minnesota that's getting that keeps a lot on the defensive side of the ball, plus is adding back their best player. I like them. I like them to at least have a shot that you can then hedge out in the championship game, but I'm not taking the big juice odds with Ohio State, so I need to get really weird with it, so I went with the Golden Gophers. Really hard for me to put in my chips, my literal money, into a team where I'm hoping that a guy came back, comes back from an Achilles tear in about a year or even less than a year, and that's the reason they're going to win the Big Ten. That's tough for me. Obviously, someone who pays attention very close to medicine, I really am skeptical of Mohamed Ibrahim's ability to, you know, come out and just be a bell cow and be, you know, even if he was were to play like to the level like Kenneth Walker was for Michigan State last year, that's not good enough. You've got to have a complete team around him. And yes, they have, you know, a very old quarterback. How the hell is Tanner Morgan still there? Um, you know. Like, that guy's been there for, like, four or five years. Um, s- s- triple super senior, I'm guessing, at this point. Maybe I'm just saying that because he's bald, and it makes me think he's really old. But um, I-, I don't know. I'm worried about Minnesota. And to be completely honest, if you're looking at betting this conference, I am I just can't look past Ohio State. I think minus 210 is actually not bad odds at all. No, so. stop. <laughs> That's so much juice for a preseason. You have to lock in that money for weeks, weeks on end. Yeah, that's the problem. That's why you don't bet it. Um, I think what we could really talk about more in terms of we'll, – we'll, we'll talk about over-unders and, like, favorite win totals um, later. I think that's where the money is. But uh, really, who do you think is the most interesting team in this um, conference to watch? And obviously we talked about Michigan and Ohio State, but give me more of a deeper cut that you kind of are excited to watch. It has to be Nebraska. It yes, has it to is. be this. There's no doubt. It, there's there's no doubt that Scott Frost is 
basically on his final year where he's coaching for his job once the buyout drops to enough for their boosters to pay him out. And this team was the best 3-9 and nine team we've ever seen in college football. They lost every single game by single digits, and I think all of those but one were by one possession. Like, this this team was so close to just being like a typical 6-6, six 7-5, and six, seven and five, like making bowls, showing progress, but... What we are getting this year is we get a solid defense like we saw last year, but we're taking out Adrian Martinez, the guy who can't throw and only would run, and taking him in with Casey Thompson, which has was kind of a failed project at Texas, and they lost majority of the receivers, their top receivers, which I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. All their, their top two receivers this year are bow transfers. I just, I don't know what to think about them, and that's why... I'm so fascinated with them. Uh, Mark Whipple's coming in uh, from Pitt. I think that will be better for Casey Thompson to kind of go away from the Adrian Martinez run heavy and just try to spread it out. But, God, you could see this team. You could see them with mm-hmm. three wins again. You could see them for some like eight or nine wins. You just don't know where they're going to land because they play every team close. Yeah, I actually really like Casey Thompson as a quarterback. I thought he showed me some pretty solid things at Texas. But the problem is whenever you play Texas, and it's not similar to the Los Angeles Lakers, but the, all the eyes are on you. The Texas eyes are on you. No, 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 no. No, we're not talking about that. <laughs> but um, like all eyes are on you, and every single minute failure that you have, you know, little tiny screw up, you get thrown to the dirt because the Texas fan base and everyone who watches the Texas um, team is there. It's a very sensitive subject. And I thought he did a lot of good things with the players around him. Obviously, it looks really good whenever you have, you know, Bijan Robinson in your backfield and you have Xavier um, catching passes from you. Um, but the games that he started to get really kind of negative press was after he hurt his shoulder. And we've seen every single quarterback who hurts his shoulder. They have problems because it screws up all of your muscle memory. Every single throw, you're not supposed to think about throwing a, um, a football whenever you throw it. You just throw it just how you always do. But whenever you hurt your shoulder, you start thinking about your shoulder and then you limit how hard you throw and then everything goes out of whack. I like Casey Thompson. I'm really excited about this Nebraska team. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of else, other people that are, um, interested. What do you think my, my t- team that I was going to talk about, um, and bring up was the Maryland team? Cause I feel like a lot of people will put eyes just because of Tua's little brother, Talia, um, there. And he put up, there's a couple games where he just went crazy and put up big numbers. And there's some games where it's like, what the heck? Why is this guy starting quarterback in college football? But you know, he's got some targets too. Like, I think it's just about time for Rakeem Jarrett to come out. You know, this is the guy that they got as a five-star prospect a couple couple years ago. And having, you know, that kind of talent, the wide receiver um, spot at a team like Maryland, I feel like is a really big weapon for Talia and someone who could actually, you know, you know lift some eyebrows. Yeah, not to go full Brian Windhorse, but what is going on in College Park? Because I swear every single year I see mm-hmm. them steal some five-star away, like some big five-star from the D.C., like Northern Virginia area, and you're just like, what the heck? Like, how is Maryland, like, this? I've never seen really Maryland be good. Like, how are they stealing these guys? But I just never hear anything about them. I just feel like they're a walking six-and-six six machine, and they just, I, I... They have so many exciting pieces, but maybe that is, it's just like college recruiting is a very well-rounded thing. Like one receiver is probably not going to change the, like two good linemen is probably worth more than one five-star receiver type thing. But I'm interested to see Maryland. Like obviously they have a hard schedule being in the Eastern division. Like you have to play the big guys, but I want to see them just knock one of those, one of those, I just one of the big guys off because Mike Loxley, I don't know if I believe him in him as a coach, but he's obviously a great recruiter getting these guys to Maryland. I just don't know how to get a read on him. Like I could just see them going five and seven, six and six. And it's just every other Maryland team that we've ever seen the past like five or six years. Yeah, there was kind of a stretch there where it was kind of getting weird. It's like, okay, you got Rakeem Jarrett. That was an interesting move. Maybe just, you know, wide receivers have made it in this league or they kind of go off and they're the number one guy. They have no competition and they just get all of like the throws and it usually works out for them. But then the next year they get Terrence Lewis, five star out of Miami. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Why, how'd they get a number 21 ranked guy in the nation um, to come from Miami? But now he's gone. He's on UCF. He transferred. So yeah. it's kind of a weird situation there in Maryland. But, you know, they've got some talent. they got some top-end talent. 
Um, definitely, I think will be interesting to watch. I don't know how much I can buy into them just because I don't know how I, much I've really, with my eye test, um, fell in love with Talia's game. But I'm interested to watch that team. Uh, anyone else that you think is pretty interesting or should we move on to um, the best game, which I think is quite an obvious answer? Yep, I think we can move on. <laughs> I don't think we need to talk about Rutgers or <laughs> even no. Michigan State. Even Michigan State this year, I don't even think it's worth talking about. But <laughs> No, Michigan State was an ugly team, and then they lose their only person that did anything for them. So yep. we'll see about that. I, I think, the, obviously, the must-see game is Michigan-Ohio State. They're playing at Ohio State, that being a revenge game at the shoe for them, and they play you know at the end of the year, November 26th. Um, that's kind of be the lead up the whole conference. And what we kind of talked about, it's a pretty top heavy conference. Um, could this be another situation where they're fighting for the big 10 championship essentially in that game? Um, most likely it will. So, um, anything really to look at with that game as a whole and how they match up versus each other? Yeah, you basically, like, in order for that game to be really the uh, eyeball drawer that it needs to be, it, Michigan has to go in there undefeated, because I don't think Ohio State's slipping up this year, and you just kind of hope for something like last year that a few bounces go your way and you're able to take it, uh, but I'll worry about that, just I worry, I I had circled, I didn't circle the uh, gay or the Ohio State Michigan game because I knew that was going to be the biggest but looking October 15th is Penn State at Michigan I think that kind of determines that sets the tempo of who's going to be Ohio State's contender and I but I really do think this is just it's really a one horse race like I think Ohio State is that much better and I think looking across all the different conferences I think the gap between Ohio State or the one and the two in the Big Ten is significantly bigger than any other conference Mm -hmm. yeah i i completely agree that obviously is one of the most anticipated football games all season if not the most anticipated football game um during the regular season so i'm really looking forward to that even if i'm kind of a little bit skeptical about how michigan can return from their loss on defense last year and the absolute you know star-studded offense of ohio state um but let's talk about sicko's game this is obviously you know college football and we get way into the weeds and we find something that's very like minute doesn't really matter to the strong you know like majority of people in america but us sickos love it like what sickos game during the big 10 season do you think will be like a low-key really fun watch yeah, so Big Ten is like sick, slightly sicko in the sense that they start playing conference games week one. Like they will schedule conference opponents, which I'm honestly not a fan of. Like you don't you you need to get out those like preseason jitters your first game and putting you up against like a divisional foe usually is probably not a good idea. But we get an ultimate sickos game. First week, I think it's it could be the first game of the college football season. August twenty seventh, Northwestern versus Damn, Nebraska in exactly Dublin. There's say. there's what there's <laughs> how can you choose anything else? Like a game overseas, which we haven't seen in a while. I think it probably would have been like the Notre Dame Dublin series, but I felt like even uh, COVID canceled some of those. But that is just gonna be if if Nebraska can't win that, like they should just leave Scott Frost mm -hmm. in in Ireland. Like, don't take him home because I just imagine like this plays into Northwestern's hands. Just like scrappy team, not very talented, well <laughs> not coached, talented at but all. <laughs> the the jet lag could help them. Just could help them enough, <laughs> and it would just be it would be hilarious just watching Nebraska fans have to grind out their first game overseas. I hope they do it like a Premier League football match where you gotta wake up at like seven a.m. to watch your team. That's how we need this. But this is just ultimate sickos considering they actually took a good fan base that sells out their stadium and threw them overseas for a game. Yeah, so it's at eleven thirty our time as in central so time in dublin right now is plus six so essentially it's going to be a 5 30 p.m game for them um oh. with 11 30 so so i think that really they really did them a favor with scheduling there but that is exactly what i was going to say because obviously being in dublin awesome but what happens if this nebraska team that we've made fun of so much and they've been so disappointing loses the first game while in freaking ireland like that would be the hugest sicko moment to start off the season. There's no doubt about that. And everyone would be laughing and it'd be a great time. 
Yep, and I would I would pay so much money to be on that flight home with Nebraska, the Nebraska team as they're just like, God, like we really didn't catch a break this year, and now like we're already starting zero and one and have to take a twelve hour flight back across yeah. the pond to like get back to the U.S. I would love that. I would seriously love that so much. All right, so um, we will come back after this quick break to talk about some um, over-unders on win totals, um, but we have a ad for y'all for DraftKings Sportsbook. The action never ends at DraftKings Sportsbook, especially this summer, with tons of ways to bet on all of your favorite sports. You can fuel your fandom and feel the heat of the season like never before. Plus, right now on DraftKings Sportsbook is giving new customers a risk-free bet up to $1,000. That's right. Make your first bet up to $1,000, and if it doesn't win, you'll get another shot to cash that in. Um, you could throw down all of the major action for baseball, golf, MMA, or more. Um, plus, the same gay parlays, spreads, money lines, over-unders, and props, your betting option feels endless. Now, if this is me, obviously, I've been kind of in sicko mode, and Blake and I have been talking about some NBA Summer League. If you really pay attention in the weeds right before the lineups get posted, like five minutes before the game, you can, if you know your NBA pretty well, you can kind of see who's going to get some extra minutes and some extra, you know, ball handling. So that's where I'd be looking at. And they're doing NBA Summer League on um, DraftKings. So take a look at that. And then, best of all, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TPPN. Make your first deposit and get a risk-free bet up to oh, $1,000. That's promo code TPPN, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show note for details. All right, back from that ad read. Blake, this is probably the most fun um, that we can kind of talk about in terms of conference previews is the over-under um, and win totals. What are some over-unders that maybe you're actually going to put some of your um, Boat and Blake bucks on? or some of them that kind of intrigue you that you might think about it. Yeah, so I'll give you two off the top. I'll give you an over and an under. Uh, we'll start with our over. First is DraftKings right now has Michigan uh, over under nine and a half wins, and I'm just taking the over on that. Um, I think Michigan, like, they're not close to Ohio State, but I think they are very good in this conference, and you're telling me that it, they just have, like, two losses, and so Ohio State, we know it's going to be that, and then, like, as long as they beat either one of Michigan State or Penn State, I think you're good, because their non-conference slate is really bad. It's Colorado State, who Jay Norvell's taking over, is trying to throw an air raid-style offense with no air raid players, so I think that's an automatic win first week. Hawaii, not on island, so I think that's that's an automatic win for and then your next one's Yukon. So you're you have the one of the easiest non conference slates. And then if you look at uh their schedule, they play Penn State at home and they play Michigan State at home. I think they win at least one of those, and you just, like, pray they don't slip up, but a lot of their other opponents, they get Nebraska at home, which is, like, probably one of the more feisty ones, uh, but they have to go on the road at Iowa, but even then, I'm not too scared at that. Like, they're very similar teams, and I think Michigan is the better version, so as long as I'm going in to uh, the final, uh, final week against Ohio State with only one loss, I think this one hits easy. Uh, yeah. Hey, me, give me with your over or under. Under? So I saw this one initially as under seven, and DraftKings at it has it at seven and a half, which is insane. Okay. Purdue under. This Purdue team is so overhyped because of last year. They they were able to get to nine and four on the season, played really well, and I know it comes uh, a little bit from Aiden O'Connell. Like he played really, really well last year, and a lot of lists have him as a all all Big Ten, second or third team, probably going to be like a third team uh, quarterback, but he loses all of his weapons. Like, he loses David Bell, who is like the reason why like he was probably putting up the numbers he was, plus he loses the next two uh, best patch pass catchers behind him, and they lose George Karloftis on the uh, defensive side of the ball, and two other impact guys. Like, they are subtracting, and you're still putting this at seven and a half. Just going down their schedule, they play Penn State the first week, I have that as a loss. Indiana State, have that as a win. Uh, they have to travel to Syracuse, which once we get to our AC 
see preview. Like, Syracuse is an interesting team. They have a good quarterback. They have a good running back. Like, one of the more balanced Syracuse teams we see in a while. So I have that as a toss-up. FAU is a win. But then you go at Minnesota, at Maryland, also coin flips. You play Nebraska, at Wisconsin, you Iowa. Like, there's so many teams in this division that I think are really solid this year. There's too many coin flips for me to see. I think... A six and six scenario is more likely than an eight and four scenario. Uh, there's just too many, uh, like there's too many unknowns on their schedule that I can't pencil them in for eight wins at all. So give me that Purdue. I love, love, love the under. I probably have a more closer to five wins than seven wins, honestly. But let's kind of talk about the Devils' advocate to that. They aren't playing Ohio State, Michigan State, or Michigan this year. That is a huge deal in terms of over-under, and I understand we might not as much believe in their talent as a team, and they're kind of obviously losing a lot of talent. Um, but winning nine games last year and then avoiding those three, and that Penn State is at the beginning of the season, you said, and yeah. it's at Purdue. Like, I understand you know, Penn State's a more talented team and should win that game, but let's say if they do win that, that's a huge momentum thing for that team moving forward into the season. But if they lose that, we've seen a lot of teams that, you know, whenever their hardest game of the season is their first game, they, they can, you know, bounce back and kind of, you know, get some easier wins under their belt and kind of move forward. So I understand why that's kind of a conversation with that win total. But, you know, that's it's a little bit nerve wracking knowing that I don't have, you know, if we're playing spades here, I don't have aces in my hand right now that are for sure going to give me some tricks. Um, in terms of losses of Ohio State and Michigan. Yeah, I just, like, I look at their past schedules and Jeff Brom, like, to me, Jeff Brom's a 6-6 six and six coach at Purdue, and it really is. He floats, like, he's either 7-6, and 6-7, six, six and seven, and we're talking, like, that, those are typically with the bowl game. He had his best team he's ever had and got 9-4, and four, but I just feel like without elite talent, he's the thorn in people's side, and that's probably what he's going to be this year, but really like what does that get you that doesn't get you to seven that doesn't get you to eight wins to put it over like that that just gets you to a six and six a five and seven type record so i i still love this even though even though that some of those unknowns with penn state right at the beginning if they can catch them off guard and not having michigan or michigan state or ohio state on the schedule i just i still love this under seven and a half is just way too high of a number Mm -hmm. What do you think about, I obviously kind of tipped my hand a little bit about interest in, in Maryland, but Maryland football team, um, yes, they have to play Ohio State this year um, and Michigan, but uh, in terms of their other schedule, they got Buffalo and Charlotte in their um, non-conference schedule and then ending with SMU at home on S September 17th in week three, um, but they get Purdue at home and they get Rutgers at home as well. Um, six wins for there. Say if they win Buffalo, they win Charlotte. They could honestly be SMU and Mordecai, um, but I think that'll be a good game. Um, but say if they lost to SMU, they could still beat Purdue at home, beat Indiana, beat Northwestern, and beat Rutgers. And there's your six, and they just have to you know mess around and win one of the other games. Yeah, I like that. I think uh, in a sense, it seems like very. Uh, it has like a high floor to that bet. Like there's an easy chance that this pushes looking at their schedule, mm -hmm. but honestly it is nice to have that insurance that you're like, well, like even if they drop like SMU, you could still catch it up later on in the schedule. And we, they do have weapons. Like they do have weapons and we've seen them, uh, knock off some of the big dogs. So I, I like that. I like that as like a high, kind of like a high floor bet. Uh, I personally probably won't be betting it because I just, like, every single time I put any faith or money in Maryland, they only disappoint me. But, like, I understand why people could, like, get behind the over yeah. right there. It's hard for me to think that that team's going to miss a bowl is my thought process yeah. on it. And, you know, like, beating Buffalo and Charlotte, and say if they did drop to SMU, you know, and I already kind of talked about this scenario, you know, beating Purdue, Northwestern, um, Rutgers and Indiana, the other ones, if they yeah. could steal one game, if, for, if it wasn't from SMU from Michigan state, they could steal one game, you know, from honestly, you never know with Wisconsin, you never know. Um, yeah. there is an option there if they drop SMU to see, honestly with Michigan state, um, to get that seventh win. So just something interesting that I saw in terms of the over-unders, uh, anything else that you saw or any other just teams that we haven't talked about that you have kind of a strong opinion or it doesn't even have to be a strong opinion, a more weighted opinion if they're going to be worse or better than what other people think this year? 
Not really. Like, last year, the big one was Indiana, uh, just, like, coming off their really hot season and then going towards the bottom of the league. But, honestly, I think we gave a pretty good preview of just seeing, like, I think some teams, the West is going to even out. Like, I think Nebraska is going to actually be a player in that division, and I think that one, they're going to kind of beat up on each other a little bit, which makes win totals hard. But, uh, I think the league as a whole is like, I think the middle is just kind of, kind of shrink and there's not going to be as much bad. Yeah, I, I agree. This is honestly, I was really excited. We were divvying them out. So essentially, um, Blake's going to be on every single, um, preview for our pre weekend spread edition. Um, and we'll get Bob and Ty on some of the other episodes, but I was really excited to talk about the big things. I feel like, you know, at the top of Ohio State, it's a lot to talk about. And these are like stars that we could be talking about multiple first round picks or you know three or four guys on their team that could be a first round pick and then there's a lot of like lower end teams that can kind of mess around um and get to that number three or number four spot um because uh, it's a very top heavy division so i'm I'm excited to watch big 10 and i've always kind of liked it um so but other than that uh if if y'all like this content stay tuned we'll be having more of this later uh i believe next week we got bobby or I think it's Ty, and he's doing the ACC next week. Is that right, Blake? You remember? Uh, I believe so. E. <laughs> I'm trying to check the schedule. I, I'm trying. It's either, it's either ACC or Pac-12. I feel like. I think it's ACC next week, if I remember okay, right. Perfect. Um, but yeah, come in, listen about ACC. Obviously, there's a lot of drama there of who's who. I'm um, gonna stay in the division in the conference. Um, and if Clemson can return to, you know, their pinnacle self that they thought they were after a rough past season. Um, also, you know, power five group of five, uh, that would be a really fun one. Bobby will be leading that with Blake. That'll be a really, really fun episode. If you like the crumbs of college football as much as they do. Um, and like I said, also stay tuned every single week. Um, we're putting out OU content every single week until the beginning of the season. We'll be starting previews, uh, position groups and, you know, projections of depth chart and all of that before we know it because it is um like three weeks to august so we will be really excited to put that content out for y'all but thanks for watching um and boomer sooner